With that, I'll give it over to Balance to talk about his uh, aviation mapper and uh, what's this? What's your second one? Is this the um, the direction finding, right? Because your RF uh, kind of hack is later. Good morning. Can you hear me all right, or should I raise the mic a little further? Is that all right? Thanks. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Balance Sieber, and I'd like to talk a little bit about how you can use GNU radio to receive uh, transponder transmissions from aircraft and then subsequently track them in a couple of different ways. This is a, uh, a um, regional airline in, in Australia. Nice image caught by a friend of mine. Uh, I have previously, when flying within Australia, they like to blue tack a GPS receiver to the window just to see the numbers skyrocket uh, during takeoff. And, um, they're numbers that you don't usually see when you have the nav man sitting in your car. So it was quite interesting to, to store the track and then put it into Google Earth to actually see the route that had been flown. This is between Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, and actually, this was yesterday. I uh, purchased a, another receiver to do some of the direction finding stuff recently. And um, this is flying from California. And once again, here we have some pretty large numbers that you wouldn't or ordinarily see. This is a, a Magellan Explorers, which is usually used for hiking. So it probably isn't um, used to flying so high or moving that quickly. Uh, but that's how you can do it if you fly yourself. How does air traffic control actually do it? Well, it's part of the radar beacon system. And there are two systems that are in use today. One is the primary surveillance radar, and the other one is the secondary, believe it or not. The primary is what we traditionally think of when we talk about radar. We have this enormous radar dish that spins around. You often see it at airports. And it's sending out an incredibly strong pulse, obviously. It paints the metallic skin of any flying brick. And then the return is uh, shown on the scope of the, uh, the controller. The secondary system is slightly cooler, but it requires the aircraft to have a transponder on board. So when the secondary system, uh, which uses this antenna on top of the primary radar, receives a ping or an interrogation. The transponder on board will reply with some information that can uh, identify this otherwise anonymous blip on the scope. So this, for example, is the terminal approach radar at Sydney Airport. You can have a look on um, my mashup of radio sites in Australia and see that it operates at this particular high frequency and outputs a considerable number of watts to actually obviously achieve quite a distance in terms of finding and pinging aircraft. The transponders on board aircraft, if you've ever been on a light aircraft, for example, when you get into controlled airspace, uh, you usually have to set a squawk code, which is a four digit number that is assigned to you by air traffic control. And mode A, in this particular system, we'll reply with this code. So the blip on the scope will have your little squawk code uh, above it. There's mode C, which returns the squawk code as well as the altitude. So air traffic controllers can obviously see how uh, high you're flying and whether you will clear other aircraft. And this is the cool one. It's called mode S. And um, I know that some of you have probably uh, heard about this before, especially from Nick Foster, who spoke about this last year, but I'll cover this very briefly again for those that haven't. Uh, MODES enables this other thing called ADSB Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, which uh, transmits a whole bunch of information about the plane as it flies through the sky. And it also is used to power ACAS and TCAS systems that uh, hopefully will help planes avoid crashing into one another in mid-flight. Uh, ANC are technically really part of the secondary surveillance radar system. Uh, and mode S is technically not, but it uses the same 
frequencies and then obviously that reduces cost in terms of uh, adding this additional hardware to planes. But the problem is because so many planes have it now and it's only using the single channel, there's actually an incredible amount of congestion uh, on this single frequency, which by the way is 1.09 gigahertz. So what does ADSB actually broadcast? Such things as position, heading, altitude, vertical rate, flight ID, and the squawk code. Uh, air traffic control systems might usually send up an uplink, and that will be received by the transponder, and it might ask for, say, the altitude, and the plane will send back its altitude. Uh, additionally, aircrafts might interrogate one another, so you can have air-to-air -air altitude requests, for example. Uh, if two aircraft are obviously getting a little close, uh, then the systems might engage and in the aircraft you might hear traffic, which is usually the uh, proximity warning. And then if you've ever watched episodes of, say, air crash investigations, I think I've watched way too many. Uh, but in fact, you'll hear the uh, TCAS system engage, for example, and say pull up. Uh, and that's generally good to follow, otherwise the disaster can result, as history has shown. Uh, if you were to, for example, look at the Mode S receiver and transmitter sites in the Sydney area. You would put in the uplink and downlink frequencies and there are actually quite a few of them spread around the place. So it's not actually only at the airport, usually it's distributed far and wide and then all fed back into a, a central processing uh, facility. And this is what the uh, systems usually look like at the airport. Different from that big rotating dish this actually looks like some sort of an antenna with a massive heatsink put on the top. Uh, and I actually noticed one here at, at uh, the airport when um, we landed yesterday. So if you ever notice one of those when you're flying around, it's probably used for mode S. Now, if we get down to the nitty gritty briefly, uh, these transmissions are actually AM. It's called pulse position modulation. So what happens is, there are particular pulses that are sent at predetermined times. This is the preamble for mode S. And then you have a data block of either 56 or 112 uh, bits. And you have these late chips that designate a zero and early chips that designate one if I have that, oh, vice versa. Uh, and then if you were to plot the signal on a waterfall, say you tune your receiver up, then you would see these bursts. This is, uh, what's that decimation? I can't quite read that. I think it's 20, so 3.2 mega samples per second. And uh, actually, no, that's, that's a little more because this is the GSM band leaking in the side here, which is why it pays to get a good antenna and a good filter. But uh, you can see that these uh, pulses, these bursts, obviously occupy quite a wide bandwidth. Now, a bit of history um, in terms of how I got into this project. Can I just get a show of hands, if you don't mind? Who has heard of or knows Frank of Radio Rausch fame? Two people, OK. Two and a half. Uh, there was the, uh, this post on a local forum made by a good friend of mine that actually linked to the site. And he uh, introduced me to Software Defined Radio and, in particular, Frank's site on decoding this, uh, this sort of thing. Um, I'm speaking about my friend Matt Robert, who has also worked on the OP25 project with uh, Max Park down the back. And this is us setting um, up a, a test run on the roof of uh, my apartment block back in Sydney. Uh, but this is Frank's page, and he has lots of incredible projects that he's sort of uh, delved into a little bit and it's a really good way to get into um, different sort of types of modulation. The very first thing here is the uh, four level FSK which is used by OP25 and further down you can see that he does some very preliminary work on decoding uh, mode S. So these are some of the simple uh, frames that he looks at and he's been using a uh, USRP with a DVSRX daughter board. If you were to capture this get the complex samples and find the uh, magnitude, obviously that's for AM, then you would see this kind of a plot from GNU plot. This is one of the first ones I ever made. You can see the preamble here, these fixed pulses, and then the data uh, begins after that. Uh, again, once you do a little bit more processing and try and determine the ones and zeros, the early and late chips, then uh, you can get your 
ones and zeros overlaid on top of the graph to actually check out whether the decoder is working or not. Uh, I actually started with uh, GIA by Eric Cottrell. Um, he separates the decoding into several different GNU Radio blocks, uh, each of them doing separate things, and that's good because it can uh, work across different threads. First, uh, it looks for pulses, then the preamble, has a, a look at how long that uh, data frame actually is, and then gets the ones and zeros out to form the packet. Uh, the other great piece of work is uh, by Nick Foster, GR Air Mode S. Uh, and this is um, quite an improvement, actually, because obviously you should talk to Nick more about this. But from what I've seen, it's uh, far less complex and uh, it actually has better performance. And it uses all the cool new features of GNU Radio. This is still very much old world. Um, now, if you run the, uh, the modes program itself, I've added uh, a bit of a GUI on top of it just so you can evaluate in real time what the decoder is doing. Um, apart from just having the AMD mod here, you get this uh, green line, which is the reference level or the, uh, the strength of the, the packet. Um, the pulses, the pulse detection is shown by these red dots. And then the beginning of the frame, the beginning of preamble, beginning of the frame, and the end of the frame are uh, shown by these negative um, sort of synthesized samples here. And this is quite handy because in the scope plot then you can use the trigger, set it to channel four, which are these markers, um, set it for the falling edge and then it will only trigger when it's actually detected a packet. And then depending on where you set the level, you can set it to trigger on the start or the end. So that's a handy bit of debugging. Um, and so what do you actually have to do? It's those, those common steps. So detect the pulse, preamble, length of the entire frame. This is a short one. Look at the early late chips. And then once you have your ones and zeros, you have to do a whole bunch of other things to make sure that the data you're getting is actually sane and makes sense uh, in terms of a tracking application. Uh, and this is actually quite tough. Uh, this is done by the next application uh, along the line called AvMap. Uh, and um, that took a considerable amount of time with a view to trying to extract as much data out of the ether and correct as many errors as possible. So in terms of what airplanes actually send down, they all contain an airframe address, which is the address assigned by the uh, ICAO. It's a 24-bit address that's um, like a MAC address, essentially, for the transponder. And there's this CRC appended on the end that can be used for error correction. Now, the, the issue is that... Um, there's the normal mode, which is used for ADSB, which is great. So when you compute your CRC and the error syndrome, you get zero if it's all good. But there's this other thing, which is used for the, uh, the other packets like altitude. And this is really annoying because what they've decided to do is overlay the airframe address on top of the, uh, the CRC. So basically, you don't know if you've decoded it correctly unless your syndrome matches an airframe address that you're already tracking and is confirmed to exist. Uh, and otherwise, you can't actually tell if it's an airframe that you haven't seen before or whether you have encountered an error in the demodulation. So that's a bit of a pain, but you can work around that. Uh, and finally, the DF, the downlink formats, are usually referred to in terms of some sort of a number. So there are particular numbers that refer to particular sorts of messages. So there's the all call, which is basically just a ping. Uh, the identity, which sends the squawk code, and then different sorts of ones for altitude, short, long frames, ground to air, air to air, and so on. Now, with ADSB, this is the, uh, the DF-17, the famous DF-17. You get all these things that I mentioned before, and additional things as well, like uh, aircraft intent, whether the autopilot is engaged, and so on. So there are, there are other interesting things that you can pull out. I haven't actually looked at that yet, but it's on the to-do list. Um, I always ha refer to this film. It's one of my favorites. Uh, who's seen Sneakers? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is that, that scene in the beginning of the film, if you might recall. Um, get the little black book and dial various encrypted systems that uh, Gunther Gunnick's little black box can, can uh, decrypt on the fly. And what's funny is that uh, this is actually uh, airspace over the Bay Area. So this is a bit of inspiration for me. Um, and this is actually a snapshot of what uh, AvMap's output actually looks like. So this is Sydney here and um, some of the planes flying around there. Uh, if we make use of this data, you can eventually 
plot these trails over a day and you can see how the uh, runway configurations change and how that affects uh, the way the planes move about. In Sydney we have um, noise abatement in effect so it changes throughout the day and then there's curfew during the night. Um, this is the application itself. Uh, it collects all sorts of statistics that I'll show you in a moment and here is a picture of the two primary runways at Sydney Airport and you can see the um, airframes taxiing about on the runway. Now this connects to the mode S decoder as before via the network. Uh, it tracks and plots the airframes and then also provides another interface for doing web streaming um, to Google Earth, which I'll show you in a moment. Here's a, a quick video of it um, running. This is Singapore Airlines Flight 212 taking off. Various other ones landing. Zooming out a little bit. Uh, and here is, I believe that's Qantas 142 coming into land. That's the 2D mode when you eventually take it through to Google Earth uh, via some Ajax and um, web services, then you get the streaming 3D view. And when you actually click on an airframe, the camera will pan down and you can see what it might look like to actually be piloting the plane. Uh, this is the virtual cockpit view from that Qantas flight. And you can see various other flights taking off. Uh, the trails left behind by those that have. Here's a Tiger Airways flight taking off right there. And these little dots are actually ACARS messages that have been um, transmitted or received by the other planes. And I'll, I'll cover that a little bit later on, but that's a separate communication system. That A um, bit of a hard landing here. Um, and I always have to add that, um, of course, when you land, you can't wait to actually get to the, uh, the gate and, and get off the plane. But um, I have to say that I've never had more fun watching taxiing about on a runway than, than I had by watching this. Uh, here's Lan Chile taking off into the sky. That was obviously sped up uh, in the previous video, but this one will speed up shortly. So that's that. Um, once again, a little bit of history. This is the very first time we went out to test it out. The airport is actually over here, and we're using a highly non-ideal, ridiculously cheap antenna. Uh, amazingly, though, it, it still worked. We have a USRP1 there hooked up to um, a Linux box and the uh, mapping software there running off a, an SLA battery. Um, we were very happy that it actually worked. Uh, this is when we set it up on the top of the apartment block and um, it's always good to leave a note obviously when you're playing around on the, on the top of a roof and nobody really knows what's going on and there are cables everywhere. So um, that was a good science experiment. We went out again um, and used more ideal antennas this time and this was I quite interesting because this is the first time we'd actually seen uh, another airframe come up where it wasn't actually an airframe. This was in fact a, uh, a truck or a, um, some sort of a car that was driving around the perimeter of the, uh, the runway, obviously having a look or checking security. And uh, that's why it came up with a different color. And um, they actually equip these sort of airport ground vehicles with transponders often if they do have to go into the runways just to make sure that uh, there aren't any incidents. Uh, so we were quite happy with that as well. Um, you'll see some interesting things sometimes. This is when the Queen was in town. So this is her plane here, Regal 1, R-E-G-L 1. Um, Pluto 07 might have been around the time of Obama. It might have been related to that. Not entirely sure. And um, this was actually last year. The IDs are programmable, so you can put in whatever you like. I'm not quite sure what they were thinking there, but hey. Um, then I decided to sort of take it to the quote unquote next level and do a, a more permanent installation on the uh, top of the roof to have constant live streaming. Um, this was the makeshift antenna I made at the time before I ordered a, a nice tuned one from uh, DPD, which is a very popular one here in the, in the States. Uh, and I put everything in a plastic box. So you see you've got the USRP1 there, you've got um, this laptop, and you've also got an SBS1 just for backup. Uh, there's also a webcam that I put up there facing out uh, into the airport. You can 
create some nice sort of uh, accumulated imagery and see the trails of the planes taking off and then pipe it downstairs and actually confirm via the webcam feed whether what you're seeing on the map is actually what's going on in real life. Um, the laptop upstairs was running Bore IP. Obviously the USRP1 is a uh, USB device and so I needed to pipe that down the gigabit ethernet I had dangling down probably six floors from the top of the building right down through, through the window that I actually spray painted the same color as the wall so nobody would be able to see that it was there. Um, and, and that worked nicely. Um, it enabled me to control the radio via TCP and stream the baseband data over UDP into GNU radio and there's a bore IP sync and source block for GNU radio. Uh, that allows you to drop it in and it was nice because it was seamless if I had the USRP connected into GNU radio it would connect directly if it wasn't then it would try and connect remotely. Um, so the, the basic flow is you've got the USRP going into GNU radio through Bore IP uh, that has the TCP server that is connected to via AVMAP uh, that has the JSON server inside it that sends um, data to the web app through the gateway and then out onto the web to Google Earth running in your web browser. Uh, a little bit on the DSP side of things and, and getting the right equipment. As I said, it's important to get a tuned antenna. Um, and the goal was always to, to drop the noise floor as well. So getting a good filter is really important for this particular band, especially with the cell uh, bands uh, on uh, the left-hand side of it on the spectrum. And also picking an appropriate sample rate for um, the USRP to avoid any spurs that come up. Uh, and then progressively you can decrease it and you can see all these weaker uh, transmissions from aircraft much further away coming through. Uh, AVMAP collects all sorts of statistics and this is I suppose one of the really um, great things about using GNU Radio and, and doing things from scratch and having access to the source code because that SBS1 box is, is basically an off-the-shelf consumer product that you can buy but you're restricted to what their uh, software can do and it only decodes particular packets uh, and it doesn't give you information about the strengths and so on. But th here, um, this is actually a logarithmic plot of the strengths versus um, the packet count. So you can get an idea of how the decoder is doing and what sort of strength packets are getting through. The blue ones are good, green is corrected and these ones here you can see are bad sync and terrible sync. Um, and if you let it build up over time, then obviously you can see uh, many more coming through. Uh, the other really great thing is that uh, it has a mode where you can actually analyze the, um, the setup. So you can change the gain on the USRP and then plot the SNR for fixed transponders that are on the ground. This is something quite handy uh, at Sydney Airport. There are probably something like 10 different transponders that are constantly pinging on the ground and consequently they're all fixed uh, amplitude and therefore when you change the gain you can compute the SNR and you can find this sweet spot um, so that you don't overload things and you also maximize um, the gain of your setup. Um, you can also create some cool plots for instance signal strength versus distance you can see obviously the close ones are very very uh, loud and then gradually they sort of drop off. Um, another interesting one is altitude versus distance helps obviously if you're close to the airport but you can see as they take off here, they kind of go up into the sky and then they reach their standard flight levels here. Uh, additionally, another odd, kind of odd one um, was strength versus altitude. And so you sort of have a combination of the, the previous two graphs um, where it sort of drops off uh, as you go this way and then you have the standard flight levels come out here at those particular altitudes that you would expect. So was that 30, probably 34 up to 42,000 feet. Um, and then you might have seen these balloons popping up before and these dots being left behind. This is ACARS uh, and this is a very interesting network that's been around for quite some time as well. It's a, essentially a text messaging system that sends information back and forth between the cockpit, air traffic control, airline operations and ground staff. And there's also some really interesting stuff, for example, the engines. Uh, will send back performance reports and Rolls-Royce uh, vibration information and so on. Uh, so here's a quick video. You can see there's a flight taking off here that's transmitting a whole bunch of messages. Um, if we sort of pan around, you can see zooming in on the airport here. There are some planes that have just landed, I believe. So this United Arab Emirates one is about to squit like crazy. 
boom, boom, boom. Uh, and generally, they do this upon landing, just after takeoff, rolling into the gate, rolling out of the gate. That's when the airline operations like to know all this sort of stuff. Uh, and here you can see one that's just gone absolutely crazy as it's come in and, and taken off there. Uh, and then the other sort of thing I like to, to joke about is if you have in fact watched ACARS feeds as much as I have, then apart from sort of the standard uh, ADA stuff, you would get the impression that it's also used mostly to inform uh, on the status of the galley and the toilets and usually the, the fact that they're clogged and they need repair. So if you, if you look, all you ever see, well all I ever see now anyway, is this lab hard business, so I guess it's the lavatory and, and it's you know, a hard failure, it's the failure mode. Um, so it just goes on. Uh, and then this little Easter egg I added in, this is actually the lav hard icon, usually it's that little coloured thing, but that's, that's my Easter egg. Uh, in addition, you also have flight paths that are transmit over ACARS. And this is cool because they usually transmit as the well-known five-letter codes for the waypoints. And so the system will also pick that up and plot them. So these ones here, although obviously the range doesn't cover nearly that far, uh, these flights are going to be flying up toward Hong Kong or Singapore probably and then these other ones over to Perth for instance, Adelaide and so on. Um, ACARS is also interesting to watch, you know, fingers crossed it, you don't and, and you only hear about it after the fact but uh, this was that Qantas flight that left Singapore and had the uh, engine failure and uh, a tech um, had taken this photo of the internals of the wing and that had been part of the uh, engine turbine that had flown through and, and punctured a massive hole. So when this would have happened and they would have lost a lot of subsystems, you would imagine that the, uh, the aircraft would have sent out an incredible number of ACARS messages um, regarding failures of the subsystem. So it's you know, interesting to, to log that kind of stuff, I guess. Uh, something else that I can't quite explain, Google Earth has a habit of randomly inserting models of aircraft. They were nice enough to insert uh, these two Qantas jets at Sydney Airport and as it happened, uh, this airframe marker sat ever so nicely on top of the, the cockpit of the plane that just happened to appear there. Um, sometimes also you can see when the airspace is incredibly congested. So these, this is first thing in the morning, just the other day in fact, uh, planes are coming in and they've been told to stay in holding patterns in particular areas while they deal with congestion at the airport. And then if you let it build up, obviously they all make it. Um, remember how I had the stuff on top of my apartment building? Well, technically I didn't really ask anybody. So they uh, sent this letter to all the owners, illegal installation of satellite dishes. Clearly I had put in lots of satellite dishes as you saw in the previous photo. Um, in fact, it was just one antenna for ACARS and my makeshift one for the Mode S stuff. And they were claiming that, that these part of the permanent ventilation system were also something that I had added. Anyway, I had to take that down. Uh, but luckily I had a bit of help from um, someone else and this is what I put together probably in, in the last two days before I actually got on a plane to come over here. This is what I call the uh, USRP half embedded. And you can see it here with my new uh, power supply. I'd blown the old one up. And this is the, um, the PC running GNU Radio, all in a three unit case. And this is the laptop that sits on top up there running AvMap. So this is uh, in an RF hut in Sydney, um, actually right there. So this was when I was on the plane flying over here uh, and I managed to get this cool shot and the antenna is just sitting up there. So it's got a good view of the airport. This is actually on the flight over here. Um, I didn't have my USRP with me, obviously. That's back home. But I did have this um, real tech dongle and this was at night when the cabin was completely dark. I'm not sure whether they would really like me having two laptops and all these wires hanging about my, uh, my seats. So I quickly shot this off, but you can actually see this is uh, United Flight um, 870 and I managed to record this quick track over the ocean. Obviously I didn't have any uh, internet so it wasn't able to load the map imagery. Um, this is ADSB here over, the, um, over California. ADSB isn't nearly as, as popular in the States as it is back home, but uh, things are, are beginning to change. This is uh, SFO, flights coming in, taking off. Uh, and in addition to um, MODES and ADSB, there's another system as well called HFDL, and this actually uses HF to transmit this similar sort of data out, and you can get various software packages. This one's called PCHFDL. Uh, if you have a good HF rig, then you can um, hook it up and receive all these um, different 
messages from aircraft, as you can see right throughout the um, uh, sort of you know, Indian, Asian uh, con subcontinents. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. I will.